All right, so today may be different, but I like different. But we're going to start off, if you would, with me, Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. And it says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. The secret things belong to God, but the things he reveals to you our life and health and blessing and prosperity to you and to your children. The Bible tells us again and again, if we obey his word, we walk in his law, we walk after God's ways, that he blesses us. And what I see in this particular scripture, and what we're going to probably spend a couple weeks on, is that see, God has all knowledge in all wisdom, and God knows everything, and he's got piles of secrets, and he is waiting for us to press in to him to receive his revelation, what is secret to him that he reveals to us. He's waiting for us to get that revelation from him, that he would speak to us about our lives and about our families. And what I see here is if you and I are diligent to sneak into the secret place and to receive the revelation that Father wants to pour out on you, that, is some, that becomes a possession to you. That revelation understanding becomes something that you hold. It is a possession to you, and it's something that you have for your children and your children's children, that it may go well with them. This is echoed in the Ten Commandments, where if you follow after the Lord, he will bless you to a thousand generations. This is echoed in Psalm 112 that talks about the generations of the righteous are blessed. And there are teachings out there about generational curses, and I believe that those are real. But I really want us to focus on the generational blessings. That if we walk in God and we walk in that secret place and we say, reveal to me, Father, how should I live my life? Reveal to me your secrets, your truths, that we will walk in that and it will change our generations. I mean, how many of you want your kids to grow up bigger, better, stronger than what you did? Right? You want your kids to be smarter than you? Like, like most of these guys that were up here, their parents have sacrificed so that they could go further. The scripture talks about us having a quiver of arrows, and the arrows are something that we can shoot further down the road than what we have been able to achieve our own selves. Every one of us wants our, our kids to be blessed. And to walk in that blessing for them, we need to walk in the secret place for us. Does that make sense? So that's kind of like a general introduction to the general concept of the next couple of weeks of what we're going to do. Um, today we're going to specifically talk about marriage. We're specifically going to talk about marriage because marriage is hard, but marriage is great. Okay? And I, I recognize that there are people here today that are not married. I know that. I know that there are people that are single that want to be married. I know there are people that are single again that are not interested in being married. I know that marriage is a great joy, but marriage is also a great struggle. There's no joy like the joy of a great marriage. And truthfully, there's no misery like the misery of a marriage that doesn't work. I know that, okay? And so we, today we're going to talk about marriage. We're going to talk about other principles in the days that, that are coming. But, but I think the truth that we have to grasp is this. God designed marriage so that we could have families, so that we could have a healthy society. Our, the quality of our community is tied to the quality of our families, which is tied to the quality of our marriages, 
And because of that, Satan is doing everything he can to wreck your marriage. Satan wants to ruin your marriage so it'll hurt your family, so that it'll crumble our society. That is his strategy. Okay, and it's, it, it's so important. I came across a, uh, a stat. I love statistics. I'm going to give you this real quick. Um, three simple rules for escaping poverty according to the Brookings Institution. Three simple rules for escaping poverty. Some of you might want to pay attention to this. Keep a full-time job. Graduate from high school. Don't have kids till you're married and over 21. Those are them. Now, here's the, here's the facts. If you obey those rules, 75% of you will make it into the middle class and only 2% will be in poverty. If you disobey any one of those rules, 76% live in poverty and only 7% make it to middle class. That's, that's statistics. And so based on that, I know that Satan wants to ruin your marriage so that your family falls apart, so that our communities fall apart. So we're going to talk about marriage today. If, again, if, you have been, if you've been through a rough, terrible, awful marriage and you've been divorced, I'm sorry for your pain. I know there's not a single person that walks forward at the altar that says, man, I sure hope this is terrible. Man, this is going to be, a, this is going to be and I know it. I'm so excited to be here. Nobody does that. If that's what you walked through, I'm sorry that you walked through it, but hang on to Jesus because that's, that's what it's all about. It's about hanging on to Jesus. I'm not trying to get you all married if you're not married. Some of y'all want to be married. Y'all just need to cool your jets. Don't know what we're talking about. So we're going, to talk, we're going to talk about marriage today, and I say we because my wife's going to come up here and join me here in uh, just a second, um, and we're going to talk about it together. So, but the, the point, or the, the underlying focus here this morning is this. Two weeks ago, my wife and I participated in what is called a Spartan Sprint. It is an obstacle course run that is about four miles long. And we were reflecting as we drove home, everything hurt, and we were reflecting as we drove home about how similar the Spartan race is to marriage. Okay? Now, we want, we want marriage to be like a cruise. It's a lot of work to get on the cruise, but once you're on the cruise, if you keep showing up, there's food and entertainment. Okay? That's what we all want, but marriage is not like that. Marriage is like a Spartan race, and so to help you grasp the Spartan race, we have, uh, we have stolen a video off of YouTube. It is a, we've, Zach edited it down to 60 seconds. So this is a 60-second video that's not us. We don't run quite this fast, but we're going to show you this video real quick so that you can get the idea of what a Spartan race really is. If you guys would hit it in the back, please. That's what we did. 
Got the t-shirt to prove it. We also got, uh, I got a couple pictures back there. Would you uh, put those up for us, Kira? And um, so that's uh, a 60-pound sandbag that we had to go for a walk with. And uh, that is, uh, my bucket was probably 70 pounds. Hers was probably, what, 50 pounds that we had to go for a walk with. And uh, that's Elena in the mud pit. Good times there. And uh, that's us finishing up the race. Uh, there's actually a bigger group than that, but those were, that's, that's what we looked like when we were done. And that's me being a Spartan, getting a kiss from my Spartan princess. <laughs> right? Is that how that works? Okay. Is that it? Is that what we got? All right. So um, anyway, we're going to do another one, by the way, in October, if anyone wants to get in shape and go with us. I told everybody on staff that they had to do one as a team building exercise. Not really. So anyway, we were, um, <laughs> we were, um, we did this race up in, where were we? Lake Lanier. Lake Lanier area it was beautiful. We had a good time. We're not going to really talk about the race itself specifically, but uh, what we want to talk about is how the race relates to marriage. Okay? And uh, I'm going to do most of the talking, and you're going to chime in whenever you've got something because you do singing. You notice I don't ever sing with a microphone? Everyone has a right to sing, but not everyone has a right to microphone. There's a reason for that. So. Anyway, so we had, we had some thoughts, so this is, this is our, our conversation on I-16, if you will, okay? So, so here's, here's our first thought. Um, a common goal in your marriage draws you closer together. We notice that having a common goal in, in the fact that we are going to get in shape and do this race drew us closer together, which really echoes what it says in Scripture in Amos 3.3. 3, it says, do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? Amos 3.3, 3, do two walk together unless they have agreed? No, you can't walk together unless you have agreed. And so we agreed that we were going to do this, and we're going through this course, which you saw kind of what, it, what that looks like. It took us an hour and 40 minutes or something to do this whole course, and we were exhausted when it was over, but, um, but it really drew us closer together because we have a common goal. And there were times where I didn't want to, like pre-race, I didn't want to work out, and she was encouraging me to get off my fanny and go work, and there were times I wanted to eat bad, and she encouraged me to eat properly, but, but we had a common goal. Now, in your marriage, this, this is important. You are battling an obstacle course, not each other. Just thought I'd throw that in first. See, our, our enemy was the course, not each other. And sometimes when things get tough, we, what do we do? We fight each other. But she's, she's my helper, I'm her helper, and we need to work together in these things. Now, to be, to be totally honest, there were obstacles that she could not do. There were obstacles I could not do. And we were able to help each other. One of the obstacles was a, we had about six walls to climb. Several were this height. And then one was six foot and one was about ten feet high. Uh, well, you know, I'm you know, hoisting her over. But I didn't complain about it. I just, it was, you know, hey, we're, we're having fun. We're doing this. And um, having that goal of doing an event like this together really helped us draw together. See, Christianity is, is about having purpose in life and purpose in struggles sometimes. And I had a pastor friend tell me once that marriage is not about making you happy. Marriage is about seeing whether you're really a Christian or not. Because you're 24-7 almost with somebody that has different thoughts and different ideas and different attitudes, and you just got to figure it all out. So for us, having a goal to work together really did help. And so I would encourage you guys to set goals in your marriage. Like this afternoon, sit down together and talk about it. What are our goals? I mean, obviously, some of your, your goals having kids, you've done that well. But, you know, uh, we, you know, we talk about having goals about, you know, retirement and savings and, 
you know, what the house looks like and painting the house. And could you imagine if my goal was to paint the house gray and her goal was to paint the house yellow? And some of y'all are like that in your marriage. Do you got something? Yeah, and so part of um, having that goal is also to prepare. Preparation. You know, a lot of times in marriage, you get to know um, your, the love of your life in every day. It's not just in events. It's the training. Every single day, you go out and, um, and for the race, every single day, we're out there, we're going to the gym, we're eating right, we're exercising. Well, in marriage, too, you should be studying. You should be reading books together. You should be going to conferences. You should um, talk to people that have been through uh, a whole lot more. Like we like to lean on KK and Brooks and we observe people that have been married for longer because they've obviously been able to overcome a lot of different obstacles. And, you know, you can be that for someone else too. You can, sorry, my voice is cracking. Um, we can help other younger uh, families as well. And that applies in family and friendships. Um, you should be always training uh, your spirit, your mind, your body, um, you know, be, be spiritually fit, right? Yeah. Yeah, so we, I mean, we literally sat on the, the sofa with a computer and looked at obstacles in the Spartan race. How do you do this? Hey, here's this, you know, there's a little, you know, two-minute YouTube video about how to do that. And you know how to climb the rope, how to climb, how to climb over the slippy wall, how to do you know all those things. And so we're sitting there together, like, ooh, that looks tough. And you know the bucket carry thing that that you saw in the picture. You know we're she, we're looking at that. And so then we go out in the garage, and I get an old paint bucket and put rocks in it and dumbbells and whatever, and tell her to go walk around the house because <laughs> you need to practice. <laughs> But it drew us closer together because we had this common goal and this common purpose. Does that make sense? So have a goal in your marriage. It'll really help you. The, the second thing that we thought that, we, that we, we take away from this Spartan race is that uh, criticism does not get you to the finish line. Yeah. Criticism does not get you to the finish line. Now, truth She's, she has more endurance than I do. I'm stronger. Yeah. I'm embarrassed to admit it, but I think she's faster, <laughs> at least for distance runs. I could probably beat you in a sprint. Yeah, you but, but for distance runs, I mean, she, like, she ran a mile this morning just like to help clear her head this morning. I'm like, Pfft. I'm going to run a cup of coffee through is what I'm going to do to clear my head. But, um, <laughs> So, so it's possible that she could criticize me on the course, like, hey, slowpoke, hurry up. But then I'm going to leave her when we get to the 10-foot wall that she can't get over by herself. Does that make sense? Our criticism does not get us closer to the finish line. We need to learn not to criticize one another, but to build one another up. That is our role. And I, and I want to read this scripture to you. 1 Corinthians 10.10. 10. I want you to notice this. 1 Corinthians 10.10 10 says, Do not grumble as some of them did. And it's referring to the nation of Israel out in the desert. Do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. Just leave that up there for just a second. Do not grumble as some of them did, or they, would, they got destroyed by the destroying angel. Here's my thought. If you're critical and grumbly in your household, you're inviting the angel of death into your home. There should have been a gasp. Like, oh no, do I do that? Thank you, Terry. <laughs> when we grumble in church, but we grumble in family, we grumble at our spouse, we're inviting death into our, our relationship. But we do it so easily. It's, so, it's like, oh, come on, hurry up. Oh, come on, you're so slow. Oh, come on, whatever. Can't you do this? Our criticism doesn't help us get to the end. In fact, I will tell you that criticism, criticizing one another, is based on your pride and your arrogance, first and foremost. 
Smile, I just told you something really true. Pride leads me to criticize. And my criticism invites the angel of death into our relationship. I need to learn not to. I need to learn to speak life. I need to learn to speak with optimism towards my spouse. So does that make sense? So, yes, there's issues that need to be discussed. Yes, there are problems in the relationship that need to be dealt with. But criticism is absolutely not the answer. There's a way to deal with stuff without being critical. Okay? Do you got anything to add here? Yeah, okay. throw it in there. Um, actually, criticism makes the person feel uh, bad about who they are, um, not necessarily what they're doing. I'm going to let that sink in. Criticism makes the other person feel bad about who they are. And I don't think that the Holy Spirit would want us to tear each other down but build each other up. Um, yep, I said it. And then... Um, but, you know, there's a solution to that, and that's thankfulness. You know, our thankfulness um, can grow. Faith grows in thankfulness. Our thankfulness shifts our perspective to see um, what we really have. It gets us to appreciate what we really have when we start being thankful. If you're having a bad day at work or you're having a bad day at home, start being thankful about what you have. And it'll change the way you see that other person. Um, it'll, in that faith, when you're, by faith, you're declaring thankfulness, um, it also helps you realize that there's a greater reality. Because we live in this world, but we're not of this world. So when we're thankful, even for the little things, man, your faith grows, your whole attitude changes, your whole relationship, um, the way you collaborate with one another. I see this in my workplace. Um, sometimes, you know, we want to complain about work, but we need to resist that because we're a team at work too. We're a team at home. We're a team at school. We're a team with our family. Um, and we need to just be constantly lifting each other up and just try to think of the smallest thing to be thankful about, especially in their character, not necessarily what they're doing, but just, but when they do something, man, even if it's little, just celebrate it to the max. Yeah. Well, you know how when you, if you're at work and your boss criticizes you, you're less inclined to do it the next time because you're afraid of being criticized. And eventually, your boss's criticism will lead to your inaction. Because you know if you touch anything, you're going to mess it all up. Or maybe your dad was like that with you. Anything you touched in the garage, you totally ruined it. And so he yelled at you and criticized you, and you were not inclined to ever do anything in, in you know, manual or task in the garage. Same thing happens in the marriage. Like in, in our marriage, now admittedly, I don't really do laundry real well. And I've ruined a number of her clothing items because I shrunk that sweater and I shrunk that dress and that pink dress that made everything else pink. And so I got criticized for that. I mean, rightly so to be truthful, but guess who never does laundry? Because I've been criticized out of laundry, right? Well, do you want to criticize your spouse out of the, and I'm not complaining about that because I'm really happy not doing laundry, to be totally honest, right? But do you want to criticize your spouse out of your relationship? You can't do anything right. Oh my gosh, you're, you're dumb. You're terrible. You're useless. Well, fine, I'll just quit. Criticism invites the angel of death to your relationship. If the grass is greener on the other side, it's because somebody else is taking better care of their yard. The third thought we got on I-16 is that life is better together. Which you, if you go to small groups, you know that this is kind of our thing too, right? But um, life is better together. I think I would have been really sad doing this race alone. There were actually seven of us in our team, um, all from uh, most of them from the church, another couple from Bullitt County that w w did it with us. But it was just more fun because we were doing it together. Because we could cheer each other on and we could just do do stuff together. And as as I mentioned earlier, my Weakness was her strength, and her weakness was my strength, and so we were able to help each other. We were, truth, 
to get to start to get to the starting line of the race that you have to jump a wall that's about this high to get into a, like a corral and she couldn't do it so if we're not doing life together she was not even going to run the race cuz she had to pop over a wall that was this high just to get there but you helped me but you're I my hero her. yeah it was kind of weird it's one of those things where you kind of look and you go oh you know i'm just going to over the wall and she's like hey it's like oh okay yeah well you know Step on my knee like cheerleading back in the day, right? And so life is better together. And she was able to run faster, and that motivated me to keep going. And I really hated the part where we submerged in the, in the mud water. That was really terrible, but she was there to keep me going. And, you know, hey, are you, you okay? Can you see? I'm like, no, I can't see anything. And Which I could, but, you know, it was terrible. Um, <clears throat> training was better together. You know how hard it is to train by yourself? You know how hard it is to eat right by yourself? You know, and, and so we were able to do all these things together, which, which are goals, but being together is great for something like this. Being together is great for something like a marriage. The, what the enemy wants to tell you is you're better off without them. And when you begin to think, I'm better off without her, or I'm better off without him, that becomes poison. When you start talking about your wife like the old, you know, the old lady, or you know, the ball and chain, or whatever like that, you, you've, you've already messed up up here. Because you begin to think and to believe a lie. Because life is really better together. First Peter tells me this, First Peter 3, 7 says, Husbands, in the same way, be considered as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner, as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. And there's a lot in there and there's a lot that we can unpack in there. But the truth that I want you to see is that my prayers are more effective if we are together than if I'm apart. Scripture says that one will put a thousand to flight and two will put 10,000 to flight. So if we are two, but we're really one in marriage, that multiplies the effects of our prayers. If we are two, but we're at each other's throat and we're not together, but we're together, that contention limits the ability of my prayers. That, my, that contention, that criticism becomes something that hinders our prayers. So life is better together. We are stronger together. We are more fruitful together. We're more effective together. And we need to learn to live with our spouse, spouse one, in an understanding way. And when I begin to think that I can do it better without her, that's where conflict starts. You know, like home decoration. And I could do it better without her. Be a Michael Jordan poster right there. It'd be great. Paper plates. It'd be great. But life is not better without her because paper plate would have hot dog on it. Peanut butter sandwich because that's about my level of cooking. Life is better together. Well, you're really good with a grill. And with your ribs. You're a great cook. I don't know what you're talking about. But, um, yeah, when we understand, it talks about in, in there that we should understand, live with your wife in an understanding manner. It's not to say that, you know, that your wife is a wimp or anything like that. But, you know, it's great to have you open the pickle jars and all those things that I have a hard time doing. But, you know, we, we de- each are designed in a particular way. So husbands are supposed to, like, serve and protect and uh, give us affirmation, give our children affirmation, give us an identity when they have children, you know, it's like, you know, the husband is the one that does that. And the woman is more the comforter, the nurturer, the, um, the teacher in the relationship. So it's living in that understanding way that our roles are a little different. It's not that we have less authority. It's just that we're charged and we're created um, different. And it's, it's really cool. I was thinking about that time that uh, Zach got hit in the face playing baseball. Yes. So these neighborhood kids are uh, they're playing t-ball 
with a golf ball in a lead pipe. <laughs> what could go wrong, right? And I'm sitting across the street in my driveway, like reading a book, and Zach's over there, and, and so the little kid swings and comes all the way around and catches Zach right here in the nose. I mean, you could tell his nose was like concave, dented into his face and blood everywhere, and he's screaming. <sighs> stop my book reading, go across, it's all this nurture, go across the street. And so then I call Elena, she, she was at work, I was home with uh, Zach, and was he in born then? No. Yeah. Zach so was three. Zach was three or four or whatever, so, so I call Elena and it's like, hey, that, uh, that health insurance we got, uh, which hospital is that good at? Why are you asking? No, no, no reason. <laughs> See, that's the kind of nurture I gave to my kids, right? Ah, you're fine. <laughs> yeah. So thank God for a wife that is nurturing. So, anyway, life is better together. Do you remember that, Zach? Do you still yeah. love me? It's fuzzy. It's fuzzy. Yeah, because they got the little birds. <laughs> <laughs> So our fourth thought, we only have, we have this one and one more. Our fourth thought is celebrate each other's victories. Okay? Now, in the race, one of the, one of the things you saw in the, in the little video was uh, they had adult monkey bars. Okay? So you, how many of you guys did monkey bars back in elementary school? I think they probably took those out now because they're, like, dangerous or whatever. But So they had these monkey bars, and they were probably this far apart. And so... I was concerned about whether or not I'd have the grip strength to be able to do this, and the, it was probably from here to the edge of the stage. And, and so I get up there, and I go across, and I, there's a little cowbell at the end because everybody needs more cowbell. And, and so I go across, and I smack that cowbell, and I'm like, yeah, I did it. I was, pretty, I was really psyched. But then my wife yells from where she was. She goes, you did it. That's awesome. And I'm just like, Like the red cape came out, you know, the big ass. I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> and I realized how much her encouragement gave me motivation for whatever was next. And the same is true at home. Now, I mow, I mow my grass, and my wife comes home, and she's like, oh. You mowed the grass. It looks great. I mean, you would think that it was like, you know, Central Park or the, you know, the gardens of, the, of Versailles in France or something. It's just like, <gasps> wow. And I'm just like, <laughs> I'm Mr. Lawnmower. I can do this. You know, truth is, I'm just like. <laughs> but her encouragement motivates me. When I, you know, she cooks great, she makes a meal. When I sit there and go, mm, wow, this is amazing, that encourages and motivates her. And in the race, I noticed how easily we encourage each other. You, when, she, when she beat, there was one obstacle that has a, has a rope, goes up to a pulley about 20 feet up in the air, comes straight down to a, a duffel bag full of dirt, and probably weighed 50 pounds. And so she's hoisting this baby up and then letting it back down, which is really hard. And she did it, and so I was like, wow! And I encouraged her. Why don't we do that in real life? Why don't we make an effort to encourage and to celebrate our spouse's victories because that motivates them to do it better. When your kids bring home a report card and all you look at is the C, you don't pay attention to the B's or the A's, you're not encouraging them, you're criticizing them. But if you celebrate the A's and the B's, celebrate their attendance or celebrate that they put clothes on or whatever it is, that motivates them to do it 
better. I encourage you to figure out how to celebrate one another in your marriage. The, how, many, how many wives love to hear, wow, you look beautiful today? Raise your hand if you'd love to hear that. Okay, what's, what's wrong with the rest of you guys? All right. How many of the gentlemen love to hear, wow, you did a great job fixing whatever that was? Right, we like to hear that? Huh? Two hands over here, two hands, two hands over there. Right? We love it. I mean, we don't want to go fix the toilet, but when we do, we'd like to get at least a, a clean pat on the back. Right? So, got any thoughts on that? Encouraging, celebrating? Well, and you know, you can celebrate when, when things are low, too. You celebrate in the highs and in the lows. Because that's probably when you need it the most. You know, how about, um, you know, when, you're, when your spouse loses their job? You can always find a silver lining. Go, man, I just, I appreciate all the hard work you're doing. And I know you can go out there and do it again. You know, even, even when we failed obstacles, it was just like, it's okay. We're going to get back up and we're going to try it at this again. You know, it's, it's finding those moments to celebrate. You know, we're not going to, like, cry over, you know, a pot that burned or the dinner that burned. It's like, it's all right. You know, David's only, like, not eaten two of my meals in the last 32 years. And one of them was a pot pie. And it, yeah, I love chicken pot pie, by the way. She put cement in there, I think. I don't know what I put in there. It must have been something sweet and something instead of something. It was terrible. <laughs> it was bad. I admit, it was bad. And, um, but you know what? He didn't like go, oh, you're a terrible cook because I didn't even know how to cook when I got married, but everything I cooked, he was always like, oh, that's so good. Oh, that's so good. And, um, you know, you're improving or whatever. And so when he said that, I was like, don't say you're improving. That's not, don't say that. (laughs) He's like, it's all right, honey, let's go out and eat. And so I was like, awesome. We're going to still celebrate even when I messed up. Yeah. You mentioned the failed obstacles. The course had 23 obstacles on it, and if you failed to complete it, you had to do a burpee, 30 of them, which is exhausting. So you want to show us how to do a burpee? Yeah. That's one. 30 of those will wear you out. I did about 100. <laughs> So anyway, our our last point is this, Um, love works to finish the course together. Love works to finish the course together. There were several times where I could have left her at an obstacle. There were several times she could have left me and run on ahead, and we didn't. We went together. And, and the nature of covenant, which marriage is covenant, the nature of covenant is we're doing this together, okay? Now, at some point, she could have said, you know, hey, here's, you know, some 20-year-old boy with no shirt on running past me really, really fast. I'm going to leave old, old fat boy over there. I'm going to go with that young guy because we'll finish faster. But that's not the nature of covenant. That's the nature of contract. So... Whatever it is that you're doing in marriage, it's about doing it together. I'm not saying you got to be together 24-7. I'm saying your goals and your purposes. And if you finish it together, if you get to the place where you're finishing life together, that's the win. That's the win. Finishing 20 minutes in front of somebody else and waiting. So like, are you done yet? That's not the win. That just makes the other person feel sluggish. Does that make sense? So love says, let's finish this together. And I personally, I think part of the, part of the underlying subcultural issues that we have in our, in our society is that we get married based on love and emotions and emotions change. And so we figure that love doesn't count. All right, I want you to hear me. Emotions change through the course of your marriage. We've been married, this summer will be 30, we didn't ever figure this out, 33? Two? 33 years. 33 years ago, we got married. 
right here. Right there. 33 years ago. And there have been times since then where, you know, it was like, woo! And there have been times since then, it was like, man, I'm going to kill her and bury her in the backyard. Okay? Like that time she backed out of the garage with the doors open in the car. <laughs> Did I say that? Or the time you were watching the soccer game when I was delivering Zach. It was the World Cup. <laughs> I'm like, hello, I'm working here. I need you. That's true. It was the uh, 94 World Cup and I was watching the game. Are you with me? Or are you with, with that game? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the point is our emotions do this over the course of your marriage. Just because it's doing this, don't, don't quit. It'll come back. It'll come back. Okay? You'll get through a tough season, and then it'll be all, you know, magic and frou-frou dust again. And then there'll be another down, and there'll be another up. It'll be okay. Stick with it. Because the whole point is finishing together. If you say, I do, that is a commitment that we're going to finish this obstacle course, which is life. We're going to finish this together. And at the very end of, as far as I know, all Spartan runs, they have this long fire obstacle, literally like fire. There's logs and there's flames and it's on fire. And your last obstacle is jumping over that. And there's the finish line. And we jumped over. I wish I had a picture of it. We jumped over it holding hands. Because we finished together because that was what the whole point was. Yeah. And, and we've, we've been through really difficult situations. I mean, our life hasn't been a bed of roses. But, you know, it goes back to the discipline and the training. When you are, you are all in with Jesus and you are reading the word, I think that most of my biggest struggles have been when I've been the closest to the Lord. And, you know, you're, you're digging in the Word, you're, you're fasting, you're praying, you're seeking God, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, boom, you have a situation or a circumstance. But you know what? It doesn't shake you when your foundation is in the Word of God. It doesn't shake you. So there have been moments when he said, forget it, I'm done, I'm out, and I'm like, with the peace of God, and I know it wasn't me, I'm like, I'm here. I'm staying. I don't know about what you're doing, but I'm staying. I'm, I'm, sta I'm sticking it out. You know, my daughter almost died when she was born, but I wasn't shaken. I was just like, God, you gave her. You can take her. Um, you know, so I, my encouragement to you is make a choice. Make that decision and stick to it. It's discipline. It's, it's, a, it's in your head, too. You know, you have to um, a lot of these obstacles, you had to look at it and go, how in the world am I going to do that? How is this going to do that? And, you know, in our lives, we have situations, you know, especially you graduates, you're going to, I don't know how I'm going to get from here to there, but God is going to help me through this. God, and, and you ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, how am I going to get through this situation? Holy Spirit, how am I going to handle my kids? Holy Spirit, what do I need to say right now? How do I make, how do I build this person up? Even though when I feel like I've been shredded down and nothing, you know, how do I, how do I come back? You know, how do I respond? And the Holy Spirit is there to lead us and to guide us into all truth. If you just lean on the Holy Spirit, he'll carry you through. He'll get you through every obstacle, right? Yep. Marriage is like an obstacle course. It's not a cruise. So we're going to pray. Mm -hmm. And um, we want to pray for the couples specifically today. So if you are with your spouse, then that's great. If you are like uh, Alex and Olivia, you are set in different rows for some weird, weird reason. I'm not sure what's up with you guys. Uh -oh. 
Uh, oh. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm just teasing y'all. Um, so get with your spouse. If you're here today without your spouse, then we will also pray for you. But I'm going to ask you guys to stand up. If you are married, you are a married person. Stand up. If you're with your spouse, hold their hands. No kissing until later. That's on your own nickel, not mine. Turn the lights down. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so so let, us, uh, let us pray for you guys, and we just want to bless you today. So, Father God, we thank you for married couples. Father, we know that it's, it is challenging to be married. We know that it is a great joy, and it is also a great battle. And I pray, Father God, that you would touch and minister to each couple here today. Father God, that you would stir us to be awesome followers of you. But, Father, that you would also speak to us that we would have a goal and a vision for our marriage. Not, not a race, but, but Father, a, a, a goal and a thought. And this is what we want to do. And we want to get to this place. And we want to, we want to get to this level in our, our marriage. And we want to get into this thing of ministry. Father, whatever it is, I ask you to speak to each couple today. That we would have a goal, something in common that we would come together around, that we, would, that we would speak life over each other, Father, that we would begin to celebrate each other, that we would look at our, at our mate and we would see the joy that you have put in them and the opportunity to do great things. Father, I thank you that as we walk in the revelation of your secrets, Father, I thank you that you bring a strength to our marriage that we've never had before. Father, as we, as we walk in the understanding that you have, Father, I thank you that our, our prayers are more effective than ever before. Father, I just ask you to protect each and every couple. Father, I, I just know that every marriage in this room is under assault on a daily basis, that you want to destroy us and divide us. Father, I just pr speak protection over each of these couples. Father, I thank you for it. I thank you that if there's a, an unbelieving spouse, I pray, Father God, that you would draw them in today. I pray that today you would touch their hearts and touch their minds, that they would begin to be inquisitive and curious about you and the life in Christ. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you do great things in our marriages, and we believe you for it today. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. You want to pray for him too, man? And Lord, I just ask that you would give us ears to hear, that we would truly listen to one another, that we would hear each other's hearts, that we would take time to listen attentively, just like you hear us when we cry out to you, when we pray, Lord, and, and we're just telling you everything that's on our hearts. I pray that you would give us ears to hear what they're saying and an understanding heart. Lord, give us eyes to see. Eyes to see where they're at. Show us how to pray for our mate. Show us how to lift them up and not tear them down. Give us a heart that understands. I pray that you would give us vision for the future. Vision of where you want to take us together. Of where you want, what you want to show us. How you want us to walk together. I thank you, Lord, that you modeled oneness. You showed us how to be one. You showed us what unity looks like. Yes, Jesus. And I thank you, Jesus, that you are at the center of every one of these marriages, at the center of every one of these homes. I thank you that you're holding these lives together. And Father, I pray that you would give us hands to hold on. Even when we want to quit, even when we want to let go, I pray that we would hold on to you and we would hold on to him or her. I just thank you, Lord, that you give us hands that hold, hands that don't strike, hands that caress, hands that are gentle. Hmm. I just thank you that you want to bless our homes. Bless the households in this place. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you for it. We thank you for families that are strong. Father, I pray for the 
for the singles yes. in our church, whether yes. they're single or single again or widowed yes. or divorced. Father, I just thank you that you touch and you bring your amazing blessing into yes. their lives. And Father God, I thank you that you are more than enough yes, for us. Lord. Father God, as, as single people walk yes. in you, I thank you, Father God, that you are the completer. Yes. Father, that, that they are not lacking or wanting in any way. Yes. But Father God, I thank you that you take this season in their lives and Father, that it is a time of amazing blessing and yes. amazing intimacy with you. And I thank you, Father God, that they can walk in the secret place yes. and receive revelation for you, for their situation, for their family, for what, what they're living through. And I thank you for it, Father. I thank you that you are no respecter of persons, yes. meaning that you show no favoritism, that you love us each, you love us all. Father, I thank you, Father, that you move in the lives of every household represented yes. here today. Father, we thank you for it. We thank you that your son came to die on the cross, that we would all be made whole and complete yes. in him. Yes. Father, we thank you for it, and we bless you for that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Awesome. We're going we're gonna to wrap up here. Um, Sean.